Uh, We're going to finish the book of Haggai today, so if you can go ahead and open your Bibles or turn them on and go to Haggai, it's toward the end of the Old Testament, it's one of the minor prophets, and um, there's only two chapters in Haggai, and we'll be finishing chapter two today. Um, Next week, we'll begin Obadiah, and uh, we'll have a few weeks in Obadiah, and that'll finish out the minor prophets we're doing, and after Obadiah, we'll be going into 2 Timothy. I know you uh, New Testament lovers are going to be excited to get out of the minor prophets, uh, but I've loved the minor prophets and what they're teaching us about the Lord, and um, when we get into 2 Timothy, um, it'll be in August when we begin to celebrate our 10-year anniversary as a church, so we're really excited about that. It's, it's amazing that our church has existed for a decade, and uh, what we're doing in, in an act of of just discretion and, and hope for wisdom is we're bringing in uh, for five Sundays, we're bringing in pastors, experienced and veteran pastors from other churches to come and speak wisdom and advice to our congregation. So older generations, older pastors coming and speaking to our younger congregation, the younger church, and um, and getting gleaning some wisdom and advice from them. And so um, I hope that you'll prioritize, especially that series in Second Timothy, in Second Timothy, as we focus in August on uh, celebrating the past ten years and then preparing ourselves for the next decade of ministry too. So exciting times to be at New Heights. We're planning some baptisms as well. Tailgate Church is right around the corner. Uh, we're going to have our uh, uh, gala uh, to celebrate the 10-year anniversary on August 20th. We'll all get all dolled up and maybe put the camo away unless you want to wear a camo and a tie. That's fine too. But um, And we're going we're gonna to celebrate good and, and just bring glory to God. And, um, and so what we're looking at today in Haggai, um, the, the series is called Dwell. And uh, it's, it's really focused on the theme of God calling his people back to the promised land to build uh, the second temple, the second great temple after the first one was destroyed when they were carried away into Babylonian captivity. And, um, and, and really, I think we have this uh, sense from the Old Testament. Um, and today's sermon, I want to try to help kind of navigate some of these things. Uh, we have this sense from the Old Testament of holiness in the house of the Lord. Um, so much so that even like growing up, I remember hearing the, the church house called the house of God or the house of the Lord. Um, I, I remember we uh, went to um, a church to play music. We brought um, the New Heights Collective was playing music at another church. And so the, the musicians went and I went and um, one of our volunteers that was running sound that night had a, had a ball cap on, which is not unusual for a New Heights person at all <laughs> to be wearing a ball cap in church. And this old lady came up and was a member of the church we were uh, playing music at. And like y'all know, matriarchal women, once they reach a certain age, they can just say whatever they want and it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, <laughs> hallelujah. Like I can't even reprimand you for hollering out. Cause, you know, but, um, but you know, you reach that age and this lady was, I don't know how old she was, but she was of that age. She was just one of those women that just says whatever she wants. So she goes up to this, this young man and she says, you need to take off your hat in the house of the Lord. And he was just mortified. He didn't, he didn't have the intention of offending anyone or anything like that. And, um, and so he talked to me about it. And of course, he took his hat off because what else are you going to do, right? You have to obey. So he takes his hat off. And then we talk about it later. And, um, and he's like, why, do they, why is that a big deal? And so I was telling him, well, they view this as the house of the Lord. And so they want to be respectful. And, and so he's like, well, like, I'm trying to understand. Like, is it in the Bible? And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> She's, she's just a matriarchal woman. You need to just listen to her, all right? <laughs> so, um, but, but we have the traditions of holiness in a certain location because God actually um, worked among his people in that way. But what God was doing, and as we finish Haggai, I want you to see this, is that God is not teaching us to make certain places more holier than other places. What God is teaching us is a principle that he longs to dwell with his people. And, and I remind you all, all the time, there's nothing special about this building, right? Matter of fact, it's, it's, it was a Chinese restaurant longer than it's been New Heights Church. I used to eat cheap sushi right there. And, and so the, the, like we would be amiss if we started to make this building up to be some shrine or holy sacramental place. Rather, what's holy about the place is the people who gather here. It's special because of us in it. If we're not in it, then it loses that. And, um, and so as we look at this, I want you to keep those things in mind. Um, now, what, what uh, the Lord is going to do is he's going to take the, the nation of Israel and illustrate this through the works of their hands. Remember, it's a building project. They're building things. He's going to illustrate this through the works of 
of their hands. And so I've got four sermon points. We're going to look at the dead hands of Israel, meaning that they had rejected God's law, and he shows them that they were defiled and unclean like a corpse. Uh, We'll look at their poor hands, meaning that they were impoverished and unable to provide for themselves without the Lord's help. Um, And then we'll get into the blessing of God and see how he blesses their hands and chooses their hands um, for his purpose and glory. Okay. Um, Let's look at the first one, dead hands. Haggai uses this macabre imagery of a corpse in the passage we're going to look at today. Um, The Israelites were working to do something for God's glory, but they were doing it with defiled hands. Uh, God creatively points this out to them using his law. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10, God had given us a principle. He'd given his people a principle of, of, of holiness and unholiness or cleanliness and uncleanliness. Um, He says you are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean. And so there are all these ceremonial things in Leviticus about what's clean and what's unclean. Um, But you get into like uh, uh, beard trimmings and tattoos and uh, shrimp and and lots of strange laws, okay? We did a whole series through Leviticus and had to deal with those. I'll never forget, we went to home church because of pandemic and I had to preach about menstruation to some women in my home. It was really awkward and and, like I could just see them like, what's this mean, you know? And I was like, I don't feel qualified to talk about this, but it's the word of God. And you look at those strange laws, even, even something like a woman who was menstruating wasn't welcome come into the temple and you're like, what on earth could something like that mean? Well, you have to drill down exegetically into the scriptures and see what what principle God is teaching his people. And the principle was not just women, but even any man who had a wound or blood was not welcome in the temple. So then the principle is, why can someone who has blood not be welcomed in the temple? Well, because God is teaching his people that they would only be accepted in God's sight from the blood of another, not their own blood. He's teaching them that the atoning blood of an animal sacrifice was what would bring them into the presence of God so that he could dwell with them in the temple, foreshadowing and lifting their eyes to a principle higher that in Jesus we find one who bleeds for us, who sacrifices himself for us, and his blood covers our sins so we don't come to God by our own sacrifice. We come to God by Jesus' supreme sacrifice. And it's hard for us when we read just kind of some strange laws in the book. and like, well, what's God doing here? And the same was true even with um, the folks of Haggai's day. They had difficulty understanding what God was doing. And so he uses this occasion to teach them about that. He lifts their eyes um, and shows them the purpose of his law. In verse 10, he says, uh, says, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. So he's going to give this kind of line of questioning to the experts in the law. He says, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. All right, so it's trivia time with the Lord. He's teaching them something, and he says, meat in the garment. What he's referring to is the flesh of an animal that has been sacrificed. So that blood that was necessary for them to enter the temple, once that uh, blood was shed and they had the meat, you know, they had some steaks or uh, tenderloins or whatever from that animal, they would carry it, and and the Lord basically asks, that is holy meat. If it touches other food, does that other food become holy? If it touches a glass of wine, does that become holy? If it touches a loaf of bread, does the bread become holy? Well, the answer is no. This is all given in the Levitical code. So the priests rightly answer, no, it it doesn't become holy. And I know if you're like me, you're like, okay, what's the point? I remember when I was in seminary, I was a youth pastor at Hamlin Baptist Church, and Pastor Jim Caldwell, who was my pastor, worked very hard to teach me things about theology and the Bible. And he would always do so by giving me a line of questioning. And he always had in his mind what the answer needed to be. And I would give my answer, which I thought was well thought out and well informed because I was a, a, you know, pretty sharp seminary student. And he would always give me this reply, no. And I still hear it like in my head when I would give my well thought out replies to his questions. He go, no, wrong. And he'd always tell me how I was wrong. And and so I would kind of get frustrated with him. I'm like, okay, get to the point and teach me what you're trying to teach me instead of asking me questions. And maybe that's how the Israelites felt. Um, But the Lord continues with his line of questioning to continue teaching them. So they've established holy things touching unholy things. Don't make them holy. He continues in verse 13. Haggai says, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? 
The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. So then the the line of questioning continues because one of the ways to become unclean ceremonially um, was not to just be bleeding, but if you had, um, if you worked at a funeral home in in Israel in the Mosaic Covenant, um, and you touched a dead body, you had to be unclean for a certain period of time because you had been associated with death. Um, Again, teaching a principle that death was not something that was within God's presence. God is the conqueror of death. And so if you had touched a a dead body, you were unclean. And if you touched the meat of the animal that was sacrificed, would that make the meat unclean? That's the question. And the priests answer, and they say, "It, it does. It does become unclean. And so we have the answers here. And you might be like me, what's the point? Well, here's the point. Holiness does not transfer, but unholiness does. Okay? If you miss all the Levitical code and all these things... You, you need to understand what God's point is in this line of questioning. And the point is that holiness does not transfer, but unholiness does. And this is a principle that's seen throughout the scriptures, and it's seen in your life as well. Let me prove it to you from Romans chapter 5. Paul makes this theological point, and he echoes what is, what is rooted in the Old Testament as God uh, teaches through this questioning. In, in Romans 5.12 it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread. Death spread to all men because all sinned. Our, our sin is described in the Bible like a disease that spreads, like a contagion that passes from one person to another. But sometimes we make the mistake to think that holiness is the same way, that salvation is the same way, that because someone we know or care about or are close to is saved, then we are saved also, or someone loves Jesus, that we love Jesus also. I hear all the time when I invite people to church, when I share the gospel with people, well, my grandpa was a preacher. All right, y'all ever heard that one? I think all of our grandpas were preachers. I just think that's, that's how <laughs> I hear that so much. I'm like, all of our grandpas at some point preach the gospel. It just seems like that. But what's that do for you? Okay, your, your papa was a preacher. That doesn't accomplish anything for you. Matter of fact, with some people who've told me, yeah, my grandpa was a preacher, I've said, well, if you, your furthest back grandpa was the OG sinner. <laughs> His name was Adam, right? You want to go back in your family lineage, the one that you're biblically connected to the most is not the holiest in your lineage, but the most sinful, the one who introduced sin into the world, where Romans 5 says that through his sin, all of that death and curse passed on to all of us. Unholiness is contagious, but holiness is not. Now, it might bother you that holiness is not. Um, it does me a little bit. I, I, honestly, I, I wish that Paul's good preaching transferred down to me. I wish that um, the faithfulness of our uh, family and forefathers was automatically passed down to us, but the reality is it's not. Young people, I want you to particularly listen to me. Teenagers, students, I want you to particularly hear me on this. That Just because your parents serve the Lord does not automatically mean that you have a relationship with the Lord. You have to lean into this and explore this for yourself. Married folks, listen to me. If you have a spouse that is really connected to the church and Jesus, but you're not personally yourself engaged with the Lord, you don't get to piggyback on their relationship with Christ. You have to have it for yourself. Like, like we, we find holiness from God. He's the source of it, and it's a personal relationship in and of ourselves. It's not something that we lean upon others for. And in the same way, Israel could not lean on the former glory of Israel. They couldn't ride the coattails of the first temple. It had been destroyed and dismantled. They couldn't continue on that. They had to own their own faith. They had to commit to the God that they said they worshipped. And it couldn't just be because their grandparents worshipped him and built a great temple. They had to do it themselves. And God, when he looks at their works, he compares their hands that were doing the work to corpses. It says in verse 14, Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people. In the same way that those who were touching corpses and unclean and then making other things unholy... He said, so it is with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands, what they offer there is unclean. So they could try to make holy things all they wanted, but if their hearts were unclean, they would only defile and defile and defile. Israel's hands were busy, but God compared them to to corpses' hands. You see, if your heart is not sincere with God, it doesn't matter what your hands do. 
You can do things that seemingly look very good. You can build elaborate things for the Lord, but if your heart is not regenerate and repentant and in a relationship with Jesus, then it's all futile and worthless. And not only that, but they were also impoverished. They had poor hands. Not only were their dead hands unable to produce holy worship, but their poor hands were unable to even provide for themselves. And God's going to actually show them that, that he, he has been using their physical poverty to, to try to draw them back to himself. In uh, Haggai chapter 2, we see God pointing out their poor hands, their poverty. He says, Now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord. So he says, before you started this big building project, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I, I love God's question. He's, he's a little bit sarcastic to them. I love that attribute of God. It's like sarcasm. It's like God is pointing this out to them in an almost comical way that he, he says, how did you fare? It's like when I go on a fishing trip and I come home and my wife says, how did you do? She knows I can't fish, right? Like, but but she, she asks and makes me just kind of fess up and, or makes me lie about it. And um, the Lord says, how'd you fare? When you went to try to find 20 measures of wheat or grain, what'd you find? Only 10, I think. And you, 50 measures of wine, you only found 20, I think. God is pointing out to them that there is a there is a, um, an impoverishment in their practical lives. Even just the provision of their everyday living was, was inept. God's pointing out their inability to bless themselves. They couldn't make themselves have more by their own labor. You see, God's teaching them that they must be wholeheartedly dependent on God. Like even... Like we're all dependent on God. Even the atheist who denies God's existence is dependent on God for his next breath. God is the sustainer of all things. You're dependent on God whether you want to be or not. And God had already said that he owned everything. Earlier in chapter 2 he said the gold and the silver was his. God's pointing out that any blessing that they would receive was ultimately coming from his storehouse. But he had withheld it intentionally and God declares that to them in an act of discipline, chastisement. Verse 17, he says, I struck you because of their disobedience, their unfaithfulness. God struck them. It says, all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. The Lord is, is now even lamenting a bit that, that he had shown them their sin by punishing them, by chastising them, and they still didn't step in order and do what they ought to do. And so the Lord's actually going to change his strategy a bit. There's a parable that, that we use to teach children this truth of how people change and how we interact in relationships about the, the sun and the wind. And maybe you've heard this parable, but the sun and the wind are having an argument one day about who's stronger. And the wind is very boastful and proud. And he tells the sun, I'm, I'm the strongest element in nature and I can, I, can be, I can show you I'm stronger. And the sun says, Okay, we'll find, a, find an object to show your strength. And the wind says, okay, see that guy there uh, walking down the street? I bet you I can blow his coat right off of him. And he begins to blow harder and harder and harder. And the guy, as he's walking in hurricane strength like wind, only tightens his coat, zips it up, buttons it, puts the hood on, holds it with his hands tighter and clenches it with all of his might. And the wind's unable to remove the man's coat. But the sun comes out and the sun beams with radiant warmth and kindness, and the warmth begins to create beads of sweat on the man's head, and soon enough he just sheds the coat. And the, the principle at play in that parable is that goodness and radiant kindness is what changes people, not harshness and strength. And this is what God is teaching them, and even though he takes his children through harshness and strength at times, he does that so they can see their utter need to depend on him. But what God does in his great goodness is he always comes out and shines. He always brings warmth and goodness. Romans 2 points out, it says, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And so has God chastised and disciplined us? Of course he has. There, we've all had things that have befallen to us because of our own sin, but God's kindness is much greater than those things. God's blessing on us, I, I'm confident to you, is much greater than those things. His warmth ought to make us shed our sin. 
And so God's law and grace are both good, but how he produces change is by grace. It's important for all of us to realize that, that God does not produce change in our hearts by law. He makes us aware of some things by law. His law is good, but how he changes people is by grace. You see, the law produces an awareness of our poverty, of our spiritual neediness. And then grace fulfills that and pays for it and brings about real change. You see, God has shown this generation of Israel the result of their sin by striking them, like he says in verse 17. But now he's going to graciously bless them beyond what they deserve. And so as we begin to finish the text, I want you to just pay attention to how God has demonstrated and talked about how he has cursed them, but now he is going to bless them. Blessed hands is point three. Israel's dead and poor hands and works had done nothing to impress God. And now he's going to bless them. They didn't deserve the blessing that was coming. The only thing they deserved was more wrath and more poverty and more death. But God says in verse 18, consider this day onward from the 24th day of the ninth month since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. What God is saying here is that they could look at all these trees and they could say, we have, we have received nothing from all of our planting and toil and labor. We have not received even the basic necessities of life. But God says in verse 18, consider. He's making this day of this prophecy a memorial for them to remember that as they go forward, they could look back to the 24th day of the ninth month and say, remember the day the Lord told us that he was going to bless us? That every day, every week, every month, every year that went by, they could look back to this day and say, when we laid the foundation in the right place, God blessed us. Verse 19 is saying, ask yourself in the future, subsequently and repeatedly, has God been faithful and blessed you? Because he says, from this day on, I will bless you. Was the blessing a result of a finished building project? No. Was the blessing a result of them doing a really good job on the temple and making it overlaid with gold and a spectacle that all nations would look at and wonder at? No. Matter of fact, by the time we get to the end of Haggai, the temple is not done. It's not even close to being finished. Haggai ends with God blessing the people before the job is done. I went to speak at a conference one time and they gave me a check for the, for the lessons that I would teach at the conference before I taught them. And in my sinful depravity, I was like, I could leave right now. <laughs> I could just deuce right out of here. Go back home and spend this money. That's why, like most of us, if we pay for some sort of job, we might pay half up front, but we don't pay all of it up front. We pay when the job's complete, but that's not how God works. God does not pay you with blessing when you're complete. When you're good enough, when you're holy enough, God pays you and blesses you when your foundation is right. He grants you eternal life freely by grace alone when your foundation is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So we see in the, in the New Testament, after the temples are destroyed, we see that the, the revelation of God is just this progressive true redemptive narrative that God's plan all along was to dwell not just with his people but in his people and he's going to give us that promise and seal us in that not because we've done all the right things and finished a great building but because he's good and we get the payment before the work's done D.L. Moody famously used to preach that we work from the cross not to the cross And if your gospel message is one that you have to work good enough to be worthy of Jesus' death, you'll never get to that, and it's a miserable existence. But if your gospel message is the one of the Bible, the true one, it's the one that Jesus comes for those who could never work good enough or be good enough to merit their own salvation, and he dies for us. And when we receive that salvation, we're like, man, I want to do some renovations because this is a good Savior. Have y'all seen this, this trend online where people are like selling their houses and buying buses, fixing them up. There's a million of them on Instagram. Uh, They get a bus, they paint it teal usually, Um, they put (laughs) curtains in it, (laughs) and they live in this old school bus. Like, like when I was a kid, like that was the worst fear. Like Chris Farley used to yell at us and say, you're gonna live in a van down by the river. And now that's all, all the millennials' dreams is to do that, right? 
And, um, and this is sort of what, what the Lord has done in his promise of dwelling places, is that he had, he had this elaborate temple that was built, but in the New Testament, he enters into his people. He goes mobile, so to speak. And so the mission of the church today is not let's get people to come to our temple. It's let's take the temple to people so they can hear the goodness of Jesus, that he loves them and he's adopted them into a family. This is a beautiful picture that he's even revealing to them. Even in Haggai, as they build a very real temple for him, he's teaching them principles about how he longs to dwell with his people and he's making sure they get the foundation right. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us what our foundation should be. It says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see that? God has signed up for a mobile fixer hupper. He has purchased on the cross an imperfect bus, if you will, an imperfect, very flawed church that he is perfecting for his glory. And before it's perfected, he's given payment in full. He's given you eternal life now. You have his spirit dwelling in you now. If you've repented and joined this family, you have the hand of God on everything you do, child of God. You have the heavenly father listening to every word you pray, child of God. This is extraordinary news for us. We can understand our imperfections, but understand that we are serving a great renovator who's perfecting us for his glory. The fourth and final point is that we have chosen hands. That those of us who've repented and placed our trust in Jesus got that foundation right. We learn that God chose us to be in this all along. That God chose us to be his dwelling place. What a humbling reality to think about. That God has chosen for his spirit to dwell in me. And that everywhere I go, whether it's New Heights Church or Tudor's Biscuit World or Coal Miner's Lounge, that's where the Lord is going to be. What a mind-blowing truth. That in God's sovereignty, he has chosen a people to dwell with. And that's really the narrative and story of the whole Bible. In eternity past, God existed in Trinitarian community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with communion with one another, enjoying being in one another's presence, dwelling together. And God in his love creates mankind so that he can dwell with his creation. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and, and the glory of God was being able to walk in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve. But their choice to sin brought destruction and division to that presence and that dwelling, and only atonement would be able to bring them back together. So in the Bible, we see God begin to reunite him and his creation to bring that together. And all of these promises of dwelling proceed. He goes to Abram and he says, you come out of the land that you're in and come to this promised land and I will dwell with you in this promised land. I'll be there with you. I want to spend time with you in this promised land I'm giving you. He goes to Moses after they've messed it up and ended up in Egypt. And he says, bring them out and bring them back. And even in the wilderness, I'm going to dwell with you in a tent. I'm going to go camping with you. I'm going to be in this tent. You can come and be in my presence. Once they get back into the land, he promises the kings. He says, David, Solomon, build me a temple so that the people can come and worship me so I can have presence with them and I can dwell with the people. And their disobedience leads them to exile. Where we get to Haggai, where Haggai is, God is saying through Haggai, go back to the promised land and rebuild the temple so we can again dwell together. And then that sweet revelation, that mystery revealed where Jesus says, this temple is going to be destroyed. But I'm going to raise up a greater temple in three days. And through his resurrection, after his death on the cross, God reveals this greater dwelling that he wants to dwell in his people. And on the day of Pentecost, he himself comes to dwell within his chosen agents in this new covenant. And all of this ultimately looking forward and longing for the day that we will dwell physically in his presence for eternity. What a great story. That the God of all the universe wants to be with us wants to dwell with us. And that can start right now. Haggai 2.20 says, The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. 
And the horses and their riders shall go down, and every one by the sword of his brother. God is promising Zerubbabel that he can rule this free nation as a rightful king rather than just a governor, rather than just a, uh, a colony of the Persian Empire. He's telling Zerubbabel that he's going to be placed on the throne as a rightful king. In, 21, in verse 21, he's called a governor. In verse 23, he's going to be no longer called a governor, but he's going to be called the servant of the Lord. God looks at him and says, my servant, which is a kingly designation. Verse 23 says, on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I shall take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant. The son of Shealtiel declares the Lord and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. And so God's choosing of Zerubbabel is, I think, uh, an indicator symbolically of a greater choosing of the people of Israel that he was calling back and assembling together for worship and glory be, to be lifted up to him. But he calls Zerubbabel something very interesting, not just the name Zerubbabel. By the way, those of you that are expecting kids, strong name to consider, Zerubbabel. Um, but he, he says, Zerubbabel, you're going to be my signet ring. Now, a signet ring was like a, a signature for kings. Um, it, was, it was a ring that they would wear that had a unique seal on it um, that, that was an emblem that identified it with the king himself coming literally from his hand. And they would melt wax onto a letter or even packages and they would seal them with that wax. And while the wax was still wet, they would press their ring into the wax, creating that seal. And then when it dried, if the seal was unbroken, that meant it was directly from the hand of the king to them. And it's important when, when the Lord says that he's making Zerubbabel a signet ring because I think the Lord is actually pointing to something even more true and more fulfilled later down the line. You see, Zerubbabel was actually in the line of a greater king we worship named Jesus. Matthew actually mentions him and his genealogy at the beginning of his gospel when we celebrate Christmas and we look at all those names listed before Jesus is born and we say, why is all this here? It's to show us that the Old Testament matters and to show us that God always had a plan all along to dwell with his people. That's why the Lord is called Emmanuel, God with us. That started way back when and even included guys like Zerubbabel. Matthew 1.12 says, After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. So with God's chosen servant, the signet ring foreshadowed a greater king who would place a greater seal on a greater building. Not a physical temple, certainly not an old Chinese restaurant, but a building of living stones, Peter would call it. We call it the church. People that God himself, King Jesus, seals with his signet ring and secures and says, no one can break that seal until I redeem them finally in eternity in heaven forevermore. See, God's signet is called a seal in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 it says in Jesus you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit the Greek word means signet ring meaning that the king of all kings Jesus Christ has placed the seal upon all of us with his Holy Spirit endowing us as the building and residence and dwelling place of God himself If that doesn't make your Sunday mornings look a little different, then maybe you're just not getting it. If that, if that doesn't make what we do week in and week out feel a little bit weightier, maybe, maybe you're missing what I'm saying. God loves you so much to die for you and move heaven and earth to dwell with you. What should overcome that? What should be prioritized over that? What on earth could be more important than that for you, for your spouse, for your family, for your children, and all of life? That's the most important thing to me, and I pray that it's the most important thing to you too.